Ghislaine Bar syndrome? Ghoulian Bar syndrome? Let's just call it GBS. Let's go. Hello and welcome to MK's Medical Review Series. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is a series on my YouTube channel where we look at medical topics in depth. Today we're going to be looking at a very, very important topic, which is GBS for short, guillain barr Syndrome, however you want to pronounce it. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please subscribe to the channel, hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such videos every time I post. Drop a like, drop a comment to Zambia and beyond. Let's go. Here's a warm-up question. A 35-year-old man presents to the emergency department for difficulty with walking, which he noted to be ascending in nature. His symptoms began approximately one week ago and has progressively worsened. He has noticed numbness in the bilateral lower extremities. Physical examination is notable for 4 out of 5 power and decreased sensation to light touch and pinprick in the bilateral lower extremity and absent patella and ankle reflexes. A lumbar puncture is performed, which demonstrates a cell count of one cell per microliter, protein of 1.3 grams per liter, and glucose of 3.5 millimoles. What is the diagnosis? Define your answer in A above. What risk factors are associated with your diagnosis? What do the CSF result reveal? What landmark is used to perform a lumbar puncture? How would you manage this patient? What is the prognosis of this condition? Keep this in mind. You may pause the video at this moment, write down your answer. I will give you the answer at the end of the lecture. So GBS is actually an acute, usually rapidly progressive, but self-limiting inflammatory polyneuropathy that's going to be characterized by predominantly muscle weakness and mild distal sensory loss. Remember that this is actually the most common acquired inflammatory neuropathy and several variants actually exist. In some variants, there is demyelination that's going to be predominating, while others largely affect the axon of the neuron. The commonest variant is going to be referred to as acute inflammatory demyelinating polyoneuropathy. This is the most common type or common variant of GBS. What are some of the causes? We don't really know what directly causes guillain barr syndrome, but it is thought to be as a result of molecular mimicry after an infection, as well as patchy demyelination of the nerve roots, which is thought to be due to autoimmune T-cell destruction. Remember, in about two-thirds of the cases, GBS actually begins five days to about three weeks after the infection in 50% of the cases, and sometimes it may be following surgery or vaccination. These are some of the risk factors. Some of the implicated infections, which are the most common risk factors, are pretty much your upper respiratory tract infections that are seen one in every two cases. And about these patients are going to be with herpes viruses like CMV and EBV, especially mycoplasma species. You may have gastroenteritis, Campylobacter jejuni, some other enteric viruses. Some rare causes include HIV seroconversion, possibly the flu vaccine. But if this does actually happen, it's extremely rare. And the benefits of you actually getting the vaccine greatly outweigh the risks of you developing GBS. Zika virus infection has also been implicated in some of the cases as well as COVID-19. Now, remember that the time course is about two to four weeks of a progressive phase, then the patients usually recover. But if the weakness actually progresses for more than eight weeks, so for more than two months, then you develop what is known as chronic inflammatory demyelination polyoneuropathy. So what are some of the clinical features? So typically, it's going to be presenting around two to four weeks post the infection. Remember, the most common variant is known as the acute inflammatory demyelinating polyoneuropathy. This is the most common variant. I'll mention the other two other variants that we have in GBS in the next slide. Just have some patience. So what you have is that you're going to be having some flaccid weakness that's going to be predominating in most of the patients. Remember that this is actually much more prominent than the sensory abnormalities that the patients have. Generally, they have ascending motor symptoms as well as some other sensory symptoms. It starts off with this distal paresthesia with proximal weakness. So in about 90% of the patients, the weakness is actually reaching its maximal 
capacity at three to four weeks, then the weakness may actually remain the same for a variable period of time, typically for a few weeks, then it resolves. If it doesn't resolve, then it becomes chronic. The limbs are going to be affected first. Usually it starts off with the legs, but the arms and sometimes even the head can be affected too. So if it starts off with the limbs, it will progress to the trunks, then eventually the respiratory muscles, then the cranial nerves, especially cranial nerve number seven. Facial as well as oropharyngeal muscles can be weakened in over 50% of the patients, especially those that have severe disease. This carries a risk of dehydration and undernutrition. And if there is some respiratory paralysis that does happen, these patients may require endotracheal intubation and they may require mechanical ventilation. This occurs in 5 to about 10% of the patients. And remember that the paralysis is largely symmetrical. Other features include decreased reflexes in 95% of the cases, especially the deep tendon reflexes. And another important thing to note is that often the sphincters are going to be spared. So we rarely see incontinence with GBS. Then you may have some pain in the back and the limbs. You may some have some features of autonomic dysregulation. So you may have inappropriate antidiuretic hormone secretion. That's your SIAD, your syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion. You may have urinary retention, pupillary changes. There may be decreased sweating, arrhythmias, especially the heart blocks. You may have things like increase in the heart rate, increase in the BP. Sometimes there may be a decrease in the BP. There may sometimes be an ileus because of the autonomic dysregulation. 15% of the patients actually can present with a descending pattern where it affects the cranial nerves first. The other variants include the Miller-Fisher syndrome, the acute motor sensory axonal neuropathy, as well as the acute motor axonal neuropathy. So in the Miller-Fisher syndrome, there's going to be descending paralysis as opposed to ascending paralysis. And you get a triad of three things. You get ophthalmoplegia, ataxia, the limb and the gait, as well as areflexia. You may sometimes check for certain antibodies like the anti-GQ1B antibodies that may be positive. Then with the acute motor sensory axonal neuropathy, there is acute quadriparesis, there is areflexia, there is distal sensory loss, and there is respiratory insufficiency. This carries a poor recovery or a poor prognosis. With the acute motor axonal neuropathy, there is symmetrical limb weakness, areflexia, and facial weakness. This is a much common variant that is seen in China. The diagnosis is largely based on a clinical evaluation, electrodiagnostic testing, cerebrospinal fluid analysis. But remember that the diagnosis of GBS is largely clinical. Investigations could be divided as blood, stool, special tests, and imaging. Blood investigations include urea and electrolytes because syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion occurs in 50% of the cases as attributed to dysautonomia. Liver enzymes can be checked for. This will show an increase in ALT and AST. Of course, the mechanism as to why these enzymes increase is largely unknown. We can screen for peripheral and central autoantibodies. HIV as well as hepatitis panel should be done. Stool cultures should be done to detect any recent clostridium, or rather the um, jejuni infection. I've, I've really, my mind has a, had a brain freeze just there. Then you may also do some special tests like nerve conduction studies and electromyography. You may do a lumbar puncture. You may do spirometry. So with the nerve conduction tests, these are actually quite sensitive, about 95% sensitive. They are going to be showing slowed conduction. Your electromyography and your nerve conduction test may also show evidence of segmental demyelination in two-thirds of the patients. But remember that you may get a normal result within the first week. So if you actually do this in the first week, it does not exclude the diagnosis of GBS and it should not actually rule out treatment. Then if you do a lumbar puncture, you get what is known as an alb 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 albuminocytic or albuminocytologic, sorry, my brain is having a brain freeze, dissociation. So what do I mean by this? You're going to be having increase in CSF production. You're going to be having a normal white blood cell count. Keep in mind the first question I showed you. So often it's normal in the first week. So it's use early on is just pretty much to exclude other diagnoses. And the CSF changes may not actually even be seen in 10% of the patients. It's very important to actually do your spirometry every six to eight hourly because these carry out, this should be carried out in a regular manner because there's a high risk of respiratory compromise. So you may see a respiratory compromise if there is a decrease in the forced vital capacity. Do an MRI to rule out other causes like disc problems, cervical spinal compression, because particularly when you have a polyneuropathy that coexists, 
or maybe causing or even contributing to hyperreflexia and barber involvement is not really prominent. It may actually mimic things that are similar to GBS. Then get an ECG that may show arrhythmias, it may show heart block. What's our differential diagnosis? Generally, similar weakness can be seen in the following conditions. In myasthenia gravis, remember that the weakness is intermittent and worsened by exertion. In botulism, the pupils are fixed in 50% of the patient and you get this prominent cranial nerve dysfunction with normal sensations. In poliomyelitis, it's often attributed to epidemics because we have largely eradicated this worldwide. Then with West Nile virus, it causes headaches, it causes fever, asymmetrical flaccid paralysis, and it spares the sensation. Metabolic neuropathies occur with chronic metabolic disorders. Transverse myelitis may cause pain, weakness, abnormal sensation, and urinary dysfunction, and sometimes you may have tick paralysis. How do we manage GPS? Recall that this is a medical emergency. Why is it a medical emergency? There's a high risk of actually respiratory compromise. So you generally want to monitor and support the vital functions. So your heart rate and blood pressure control, you measure your forced vital capacity frequently, six to eight hourly. And remember that if the vital capacity drops to less than 15 mils per kg, endotracheal intubation is needed. A very important sign is that if you're unable to lift the head off the pillow by flexing the neck, this is actually a danger sign because it usually happens simultaneously with phrenic nerve or diaphragm paralysis, and this can actually cause the patient to die. If they can take oral fluids, give them oral fluids, but if they can't, give them IV fluids and make sure that you maintain the urine volume at least 1 to about 1.5 liters per day. Protect the extremities for any trauma and prevent any bed sores or pressure sores. Heat therapy can be used if they're in pain, and this actually makes early physical therapy much more possible because if they're immobilized for a long time, there is a risk of ankylosis, there is a risk of contractures, there is a risk of DVT. So you should perform passive full range movements of the joints as early as possible, and then active exercises can be initiated once these acute symptoms subside. Then, of course, do give them DVT prophylaxis, so your low molecular weight heparin, which is your enexaparin, also referred to as clexane. So you're going to be using this to prevent the DVT in the bed-bound patients. And there are some studies, some meta-analysis studies that have shown that low molecular weight heparin is actually more effective than low-dose unfractionated heparin, which is typically given as 5,000 units twice a day, and but it still has the similar risk of bleeding. IV immunoglobulins as well as plasma exchange can be done if the patients are severe or non-ambulatory. ICU transfer is done also if there is a decrease in the forced vital capacity. There is a knee-jerk response of all medical students to say that because it's an autoimmune condition, we do give steroids, but steroids have not been implicated in GBS. They should not be given because they may actually even worsen the outcome. When it comes to the IV immunoglobulins, these are just pooled IgG antibodies from more than a thousand donors. The mechanism of how they work is largely unknown, but what we postulate is that it neutralizes the cytokines, it modulates the FC receptor-mediated phagocytosis, as well as stimulates complement removal of all antibody, including host anti autoantibodies. So how is it given? We give this early. We give about 2 grams per kg over 1 to 2 days, or we can give it slowly as 400 milligrams per kg IV once a day for 5 consecutive days. This is the treatment of choice. And this actually has some benefit up to 1 month of from the disease onset. Side effects include infections from the donor, anaphylaxis if the patient has an IgA deficiency, and if the patient actually reacts to this, then the plasma exchange is an alternative in these patients. So in a plasma exchange, if we do this quite early, it's actually quite effective and it is used when the IV IgG is actually ineffective. So the plasma exchange actually shortens the disease course and the hospital stay. It reduces mortality risk and incidence of permanent paralysis. It may actually cause hypotension because of the large fluid shifts that are associated with the process. IV access is also difficult and may actually cause certain other complications. So the plasma exchange actually removes any previously administered immunoglobulins that negate their effects and they negate their benefits. So this should be done generally after waiting some time and the waiting period should be about two to three days before you actually do a plasma exchange given if this patient has received IV, and, uh, IV antibodies. Now, the prognosis is generally good. GBS is fatal in less than 2% of the patients, 
80% of the patients actually recover, even though they may have been fully paralyzed. 10% can't walk after one year. 10% actually die. So most patients actually improve considerably over a period of months and about 30% of adults and even more children have residual weakness at about three years afterwards. So the patients that do have these residual defects may require retraining, they may require orthopedic appliances, they may sometimes even require surgery. But generally after the initial improvement, two to 5% of patients actually do develop the chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyoneuropathy. Back to our warm-up question, a 35-year-old man presents to the emergency department for difficulty with walking, which is noted to be ascending in nature. His symptoms began approximately one week ago and has progressive worsening, or has progressively worsened. He has noticed numbness in bilateral lower extremities. Physical examination is notable for power, 4 out of 5, and decreased sensation to light touch and pin prick in the bilateral lower extremity and absent patella and ankle reflexes. A lumbar puncture is performed, which demonstrates a cell count of one cell per microliter of CSF. Then protein is 1.3 grams per liter. Glucose is 3.5 millimoles per liter. What is the diagnosis? So this is GBS, most likely an acute inflammatory demyelinating polyoneuropathy. So this is simply an acute, usually rapidly progressive, but self-limiting inflammatory polyneuropathy characterized by weakness and mild distal sensory loss. Risk factors include surgery, previous trauma. You may also even have infections, which are in the bulk majority, the upper respiratory tract infections, the CMV and the EBV, mycoplasma, gastrointestinal, campylobacter, that's the name I was looking for earlier on, on the other slide, Campylobacter, jejuni, entero, uh, enteric viruses, and then rare causes like HIV, the flu vaccines, Zika virus, and even COVID-19. Now, the CSF result shows an increase in the protein. Remember, protein is 0.2 to 0.4 grams per liter. This is 1.3. Normal cell count. Remember that you should have less than 10 red blood cells per high power field and less than 5 white blood cells per high power field. Then the normal glucose, because glucose is about two-thirds to a half of the plasma glucose. 3.5 millimoles is within the normal range. The landmarks that we're going to be using for a lumbar puncture are the line that's going to be connecting both iliac crests. Remember, this line crosses at the level of L4, L5 intervertebral space, or the L4 vertebra. How do we manage this patient? We admit them, preferably to an ICU. Monitor the, the force vital capacity six to eight hourly, BP control, fluid balance, so ensure that the urine output is 1 to 1.5 liters per day. Heat therapy can be given if he's in pain, physiotherapy, DVT prophylaxis, and either an IV, IgG infusion, or plasma exchange. Generally, the prognosis of the condition is good. Thank you for spending your time to listen to this lecture on GBS. If you did enjoy, please consider subscribing to the channel. Hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such videos every time I post. Tell a friend to tell a friend we are doing lectures on the video to Zambia and beyond. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. Bye-bye.